So, who's seen Wolverine and the X-Men? Not a whole bunch of people, that's for sure, but I'm now one of them. And if you've clicked on this video, I'm guessing there's a decent chance you are too. And if not, then just watch it, I guess. It's not very long. Only one season of 20 minute episodes. Or if not, just watch the season premiere, because that's mostly what we're talking about today. You see, I wanted to explore this show's setting a little, and how it's a parable for a possible not too distant future where the United States collapses into fascism. That might sound a little extreme, but give me a chance to explain what I mean. I will just say also that a lot of the stuff I'm gonna mention isn't like exclusive to this show alone. A lot of these elements have appeared in other X media, be it the comic books, other shows or films. But the reason I'm exploring it through Wolverine and the X-Men is twofold. First, this show opens with this stuff at the forefront and commits to it. The opener, as we will see, isn't really an introduction to this show's characters, but instead it's setting following mainly Wolverine as he interacts with mainly unnamed and narratively insignificant normal people. This show sets up from its first episode a strong focus on the effects of its authoritarian world on its citizens, a proportionately greater focus than most other X media. And this is a theme which ripples throughout its entire run. And second, you guys have been asking me to talk about this show for a while, so here we go. So yeah, the first episode, it follows Wolverine. He's leaving the X-Mansion, and we don't know why just yet. Suddenly, there's some sort of attack. We learn that the mansion is destroyed, and Xavier and Jean disappear, presumed dead, and the X-Men disband. And then we cut to a year later, and Wolverine's on the run. Later in the show, of course, we learn more about the attack, but I don't want to focus on that today. Instead, let's talk about what we see in the aftermath, while Wolvie is on the lam. So he's just vibing out until he comes across a little traffic accident. Naturally, despite his gruff exterior, Logan's all heart, so he gets to the site and saves a little girl from a barbecue end. At the cost of passing out and being reported to the MRD by Carl. Forget him. He's the MRD's problem now. You turned him in, Carl? After what he did? He's got razors in his hands, Randy. Side note, I'm impressed that the artists managed to create a guy who's so clearly a Carl. Like, have you ever seen someone fit the name Carl more than this? I didn't think so. But the MRD are called. That's the Mutant Response Division. And we'll get into detail on them soon. But the next part is, I think, the most interesting and the most important part of the episode. This human family hides Wolverine, but they're arrested anyway and taken to some sort of detention camp. After this, Wolverine meets up with Beast, Hank McCoy, and together they bust out this human family as well as some other imprisoned mutants. But hold on, we know that the MRD or similar groups often pop up in Marvel media and capture mutants. It's less common though for them to be willing and able to imprison humans just as quickly. I think that part merits a closer look. As he's being arrested, this exchange takes place. Ah, you have no right to do this! No right to do this? Well, clearly they do. But why? How? Well, I think it's made clear in the background of this show, behind the mutant powers and explosions, that this is a society slipping quietly into fascism, and that the season premiere sets this up as a concern, and possibly even as a warning from the very start. To get anywhere with this though, we're gonna have to establish what qualifies a society to be or resemble fascism because it's not just an authoritarian society. Like any social construct, since fascism isn't a physical thing we can objectively recognize, different people have different definitions for it. In my experience, the best definitions are given by figures like Umberto Eco and Roger Griffin, and I found these two conceptions of fascism to be very helpful personally in understanding today's shifting political landscape. But unfortunately, a lot of their details concern parts of society we don't really get to see much of in Wolverine and the X-Men, things like art and intellectual movements, so they're not much help in this case. Instead, I think we're best to use Lawrence Britt's 14 Common Threads of Fascism, which he published in an article from 2003 called Fascism, Anyone? The point which I need to make here is that societies meeting these points aren't necessarily fascist, they're proto-fascist, meaning similar in some ways to true fascism and perhaps a state in transition. 
But of these 14 points, we see at least half in just the first few episodes of Wolverine and the X-Men, and I'll run over these quickly to prove it. Point one is powerful and continuing expressions of nationalism. Now, at first glance, there's not so much in the way of overt nationalism, but in Senator Kelly's speeches, we see pretty much all of the things Brit claims commonly express this nationalism. That is, catchy slogans, pride in the military, or hear the MRD, and demands for unity. Coincidence? Well, if we look at the podium from which Senator Kelly is speaking, it seems not. It's decked out in the red, white, and blue, so clearly there is some link between these rhetorical flourishes and a sort of performative national pride. So for me, this ticks that box. Point two is a lot more obvious. It's disdain for the importance of human rights. And Brit writes, the regimes themselves viewed human rights as of little value and a hindrance to realizing the objectives of the ruling elite. Through clever use of propaganda, the population was brought to accept these human rights abuses by marginalizing, even demonizing those being targeted. We see this clearly in the rest of the human family in episode one. Clearly at some point their rights have been eroded. After all, they're imprisoned straight away in terrible conditions. And that second part, where Brit mentions the population was brought to accept these human rights abuses by marginalizing, even demonizing those being targeted, we see that with Carl, who completely turns against his friend in a second. Point three is identification of enemies slash scapegoats as a unifying cause. And the use of scapegoating as a mean to divert the people's attention from other problems, to shift blame for failures, and to channel frustration in controlled directions. Moreover, Brit continues, active opponents of these regimes were inevitably labelled as terrorists and dealt with accordingly. Again, this is something which we see a whole bunch of in Senator Kelly's speech in episode 2, mutants obviously being the scapegoats. Kelly unifies his audience by building up hatred and fear around them, and the episode ends with him openly informing the X-Men, you know, the good guys, that their days are numbered, like Brit says, labelled as terrorists and dealt with accordingly. What's more, Kelly is your classic populist firebrand, using inflammatory rhetoric, and Angel's dad even refers to him as a champion of the people. Even outside of Brit's list, one of the most common hallmarks of fascist societies is that they spring up around a charismatic, golden-throated leader revered by his followers. Is that what we're seeing here? Point four is the supremacy of the military slash avid militarism. Ruling elites always identified closely with the military and the industrial infrastructure that supported it. And I don't think this one requires much explanation either. The MRD here stand in for the military, who seem as noted above to have unrestricted authority to detain and attack civilians, all while being idolized, both by creeps like Carl and by ruling elites like Senator Kelly. Point seven is obsession with national security. Inevitably, a national security apparatus was under direct control of the ruling elite. It was usually an instrument of oppression, operating in secret and beyond any constraints. Its actions were justified under the rubric of protecting, quote, national security. And questioning its activities was portrayed as unpatriotic or even treasonous. This point is the twisted reasoning behind figures like Kelly's and that little cretin Carl's hateful anti-mutant action. It's the reason they always use. It's about safety. These mutants are dangerous. We need to monitor them. We need to lock them up. And when anyone opposes this, like this family, they get locked up too. Kelly literally says, They're waging war on us people. It's time we fight back. Point nine is power of corporations protected. Although the personal life of ordinary citizens was under strict control, the ability of large corporations to operate in relative freedom was not compromised. Now, I don't know about you, but this reminds me of episode five, Thieves' Gambit. We see Wolverine tracking down a mutant suppressing collar, which was stolen, as it turns out, by a corporation hired by Senator Kelly. So for one, this thievery is permitted, but that's not the point. The point is that the corporation hires Gambit to steal it. So even when mutants are being registered and captured, Kelly's fine with the corporations using mutant powers to achieve his own ends. Very hypocritical and very relevant to point nine on Brit's list. 
The last point on Brit's list that I think we see is 12. Obsession with crime and punishment. Most of these regimes maintain draconian systems of criminal justice with huge prison populations. The police were often glorified and had almost unchecked powers, leading to rampant abuse. Normal and political crime were often merged into trumped up criminal charges and sometimes used against political opponents of the regime. Again, I'm sure I barely have to explain this because of the amount of times we see the MRD abuse their powers and the amount of mutants and mutant sympathizing humans we see them in prison. But there you have it, the society we see in this show has a lot of these proto-fascist qualities. Brit's list has been received somewhat controversially, with critics claiming it's too general, but some of this is due to an abridged and altered version of the list which did the rounds a few years ago. The version I've quoted and shown is the original. But we don't have to stop with this list, there's other hallmarks of fascism that Wolverine and the X-Men seems to evoke. We see the first in the episode Future X where we're shown the endgame of the changes pushed by figures like Kelly. I won't linger on this, but much of the episode takes place in a camp where Charles and the other surviving mutants are concentrated before they're taken away and never heard from again. Now, I don't want to get demonetized, you'll have to use your brain a little bit and read between the lines, but these camps are an uncomfortable echo of a dark chapter in human history, in which people were treated similarly for the crime of being biologically unacceptable to those in power. There's perhaps another reference to real-world fascist history in the show's present, and it's Genosha, Magneto's mutant ethnostate. This is presented as a good thing, that mutants have a place to go and claim refuge and be safe, but the fact that there's billboards for it up in the US suggests that the X-Men's homeland is trying to advertise some sort of exodus, or at the very least that the anti-mutant powers that be are comfortable facilitating mutant migration away to a safe state. But as we see in Future X, this escape route doesn't stop things from getting worse for the mutants domestically. This is perhaps in parallel to the Havara Agreement, in which Germany allowed Jews to flee to what would become Israel in the 1930s. But as I'm sure you know, it didn't stop Mustache Man from doing an oopsie a few years later. Again, sorry for the vagueness, but you know what I'm talking about. So there's parallels throughout the setting of this show to real-world fascist regimes. As a result, it seems that the present-day sections of Wolverine and the X-Men show a society in crisis, proto-fascist and becoming closer and closer to the real thing. A country uniting itself in hatred for a biological minority, an outgroup who they fear. But like any fascist regime, it's not about reality, it's about power. So what does Wolverine and the X-Men tell us, a little over 10 years on, in a time when a lot of this hateful rhetoric is seeming more and more common? Well, in many ways, it tells us the same things that X-Men stories always have. Don't judge anyone for who they are, the things they can't change. Be that mutant genetics, race, or sexual orientation and be wary of those who try to, and those who use hate or stereotypes or scapegoats of minority groups as fuel for a movement to gain power and gain a following. Because this has led to awful, awful things in our history, and there's no reason to assume that it couldn't again. So there you have it, a dark video essay for a dark show. What do you think? Do you see anything oddly familiar about this show's depiction of a world sleepwalking into fascism? And do you want to see more videos on this show? I promise they won't all be uh, this horrific. Let me know below. But yeah, that's it for now. Remember to like and sub if you haven't already. Oh yeah, and if there's any fascists watching this, eat shit.